In the previous section, we looked at how we could analyze a graph using the first derivative. Here, we will be looking at how the second derivative will help us analyze a graph. More specifically, it's go we're going to be looking at what's called the concavity of the graph, and that is what the second derivative is going to help us uh, find. Where concavity changes, that's called an inflection point, and so we will be finding those as well. And we're going to be looking at different kinds of graphs, being able to graph, and those types of things. So let's just start out with what is concave up and what does concave down mean? Well, if you think about concave up means it's cupped up upwards. In the other words, it could hold water if it was a cup turned right side up. Concave down would be turning the cup upside down. So as we look at this graph, we're going to determine the intervals where the, con where the graph is concave up or down. So let's just go from left to right. So I'm going here. I'll look at this part, and that is definitely concaved downward all the way to about right here. Then we start being cupped upwards here. So somewhere along the line, it changes from a down to an up, and it looks at about one and a half. So determine the intervals. That would be the domain, and we're going to assume that these go on forever out to the side, so we have a domain of all real numbers. So I would say that it would be concaved upward from, let's call that one and a half to infinity, and concaved downward from negative infinity to one and a half. And then right here, and again that's just an estimate if that looks like one and a half to you, um, that would be what would be called an inflection point because the concavity has changed. Right? Look at number three. It's a little bit more obvious. All of this is definitely concave down. All of this is concave down. But I don't think we should say that it's concave down from negative infinity to positive infinity because something is happening right here. It's not an inflection point, but it's going to be called something else as we get into the lecture. So let's see, it's always concave downward, and I'm going to go from negative infinity to zero, and then from zero to positive infinity. Let's look at these graphs. Again, following along, definitely that looks like it's concaved up and then it changes to down. It's kind of like that part's down. Let's see, I got carried away a little bit because it changed. Right at about here, it started con being concaved upwards again. So you kind of put your hand inside my con, am I turning my hand down or am I cupping it upwards? So let's see. So I'm going to say up is from negative infinity to zero and then it looks like it starts from 1 to infinity. And it's concave downward from 0 to 1. All right, let's look at number 7. That's a kind of funny looking graph, very much like uh, number 3, in that if this continues, I guess, that's concave down, that's definitely down, that's definitely down. So even though negative 2 and positive 2 are not inflection points, they are going to become something else. So we're going to say it's concave downward from negative infinity to negative 2, from negative 2 to 2, and then 2 to infinity. The next thing you're going to be asked to do is not to sketch a graph, but kind of pre-sketching a graph, meaning can you choose the right graph with certain properties. And so um, the book sums it up, I think, really well here to kind of give you an idea of what it might look like. Okay, so this is comparing the first and the second derivative. So this says the first derivative is greater than zero. All right, so that means it's increasing. The graph is going upward. This says the second derivative is greater than zero. So that's why it's concave upward. And so you'd have something that looks like that in part of the graph and so forth. So you can also have a first derivative that's increasing, but you could also have a second derivative that's negative, and that's going to be called, see it's still going up in value, but concave downward. Here we have, this is decreasing, and that's increasing, looks like this, and then both are decreasing, 
right? So the first derivative tells you is the y values going up or down, and the second derivative tells you about the concavity. So let's see if we can match some of these graphs. All right, so on number 11, it says the function at 2 equals to 1. That means when x is 2, y is 1. Well, if you notice, all three of those graphs, that's true. The next part says that the derivative at 2 is greater than 0, meaning that it's positive. That also means that it's increasing. First derivative is the slope of the tangent line. So if you took a little tangent line, which one would you say would have a positive slope? Well, I would say A or C, but not B, because that looks like the slope is 0. So we can eliminate that one now. Right now, this part says the second derivative is less than 0. So that's negative, meaning it's concaved downward. Back up here. Well, this whole graph looks like it's concave downward. We've already eliminated part B. And here, it looks like part of it's up and then part of it's down. So it can't be C. So it must be part A. And that's how you would go through eliminating your choices. All right, so let's look at number 12. So first of all, it says the function at 1 is equal to 2. That means when x is 1, y is 2. Well, they all have that same dot, so they're good. All right, the next part says something about the first derivative. It says the first derivative is positive in two intervals, but it leaves out one. Now remember, the first derivative means the slope of the tangent line. So if I drew little tangent lines all along here, that would have a positive slope. When I got here, I would have a slope of zero, but notice they left out one, but everywhere else I would have a positive slope. Same thing here. I think those all three are good. It's the second part, hopefully, that's going to give us some insight. It says the second derivative at 1 is 0. Now, the second derivative describes the concavity. So it's saying that it's not up or down at the value of 1. Well, let's see. Here, at this point, we've got concave up concave down, what's going on there? We've got concave down and concave up, and right there, neither one. Same thing here. So what graph could this be? Well, we have to really go back to the first derivative. This one's really quite tricky. There's a reason why the first derivative is increasing everywhere except at 1. Let's see what's happening at 1. The first derivative at 1 on part A, that would be the slope of the tangent line. They've even kind of drawn it. That slope is undefined. This slope is 0. And this, well, that's called a corner, and you can't have a derivative. It would be like trying to balance a line on a corner, almost like a seesaw. And so this means that the first derivative here is undefined. And up here it says the first derivative is undefined. Now that's at the point x is 1. Well, so how does this rule out the graph? If the first derivative is undefined at that value, that's going to tell you the second derivative is also going to be undefined at that value. So the only graph it can possibly be is part b. All right, so let's look at number 13. All right, so here we come back to that, that the derivative is undefined. The first derivative is undefined at 0. Well, that would be true here because you have a corner. Let's see. Uh, same thing here. We have an open circle, and we have a corner. And here it looks like we have what's called an asymptote, and so that would also be undefined. So a, b, and c are all good. Then the next part says f is decreasing, just the function is decreasing from negative infinity to 0, meaning the y values are going down. Well, let's see, from negative infinity to 0, I'm going down, down, down. That would be true. The y values are down here. The y values are down here. So again, we've not eliminated anything. Okay, the next part, f is concave downward from 0 to 3. All right, well, that looks like it's concave downward from 0 to 3. 
This looks like it's concave downward from 0 to 3. But let's see, yep, from 0 to 3. So again, all three look good. The last part says F has an inflection point at X equals to 3. An inflection point is where the concavity changes. So let's see, here at 3, same concavity. There's nothing that indicates that it's going to be concaved upward. So it can't be A. All right, here it's concave down, and then when we get to 3, it's concaved up. Well, that looks good. And then, so it could be C, but let's look at part uh, B. Let's see, it says we've gone from concave downward, and then this part looks like it's concaved upward. So it could be B or C. Hmm, what could we rule out? It has to have an inflection point at x equals to 3. That means the graph, the function has to be defined. That means when x is 3, y has to be something. And right here is a big O empty circle, which means the function is not defined at 3 on part C. So it can't be that one. It's got to be part B. I know that's a little tricky. But as we go through some of the graphs on our own, hopefully that'll get better. But to summarize it up, an inflection point is the change in concavity. And where it's um, undefined, the first derivative can be a corner or an asymptote. Right now, we're going to use the derivative to find the concavity of our graph. So we have some steps here. It says, first of all, that we need to determine the values of x for which our second derivative is 0 or our second derivative is not defined. That's exactly what we did in the previous section with the first derivative, and they called those critical points. The second part is we're going to put those numbers on a number line and then test the intervals. Again, very much like we did in section 4.1. Alright, so it says first of all determine the values for which the second derivative is 0 or undefined. So that means I've got to find the second derivative. Well this is really nice. It says the second derivative is always 4. It's a constant. And 4 is positive. So that tells me this is always going to be concaved up. Right, so it's up from negative infinity to positive infinity. Now, if you go back to this, hopefully you would know that that's a parabola. And since the 2 in front is positive, it would look something like that. And that's concaved upward. So that kind of confirms our first our derivative test. Okay, so I've got to find the first derivative. And now I need to find the second derivative. Okay. Now that's not a constant, so I have to find where the second derivative is undefined or equal to zero. The only, uh, let's see, we don't have anything in the denominator, so it's not undefined anywhere. So let's set that equal to zero and solve for x. I'm going to factor out a 12x, so then do I go to my number line, and I'm going to test numbers in each region. So let's see, I'm going to pick a negative 1 here, a positive 1, and a 4. And where I want to test that back in is into the second derivative. And again, just like on the first derivative, it doesn't matter what these necessarily equal to. It's just a matter of are they positive or negative. So let's see, this is going to be 12 plus 36, which is 48. So that's positive. So that means it's up here because the second derivative is positive. It's concaved upward. Here we're going to have 12 minus 36, which is negative. So it's going to go down in that part. And then this, that's also 48. And so it would be positive. So we would say it's concave up from negative infinity to 0 and 3 to infinity. It's concave downward from 0 to 3. So we have a strange exponent. Same idea, though. We're going to take the first derivative. Then we're going to take the second derivative. Now, I know that looks scary. But let's rewrite that without negative exponents. So my second derivative is negative 12 over 49 x to the positive 10 sevenths. Okay. So I need to know where that is undefined and or equal to 0. 
Well, a fraction, the only time a fraction can equal to zero is when the numerator is zero. Because see, if I cross multiply, I get zero equals to negative 12. And that just doesn't make sense. But where is it undefined? Well, when you have a fraction and there is a variable in the denominator, you have to ask yourself what value um, would cause that denominator equal to zero. And hopefully you can see that it would just be zero. So our one point we need to test on the number line is zero. All right, so I need to evaluate the second derivative to the left and to the right of zero. Um, I'm going to pick a negative one and a positive one. It would be negative 12 over 49. That's the seventh root of negative 1 to the 10th power. Okay, so first of all, negative 1 to the 10th power is going to be positive 1. Any root of 1, is that's going to be 1 times 49. So all of this is positive. This is negative. So negative over positive is negative. So that means this part is going to go down. Same thing over here. That's all positive. That's negative. So this is negative. So it's going to go down. So we would say it's concave down, not from negative infinity to positive infinity, because it's undefined at zero. We would say, so we would say it's concave down from negative infinity to zero, and then zero to infinity. All right, let's look at number 41. We have a rational function. We need to find the first and second derivative. So I could write this as 2 plus x squared to the negative 1 power. And then I can just use the power rule. And I'm doing that because my numerator is just 1. If it was something other than 1, I would be using the quotient rule. All right, so my first derivative, don't forget to take the derivative of the inside part, which would be 2x. So let's see, my first derivative would be negative 2x on top of 2 plus x squared squared. So again, I put that negative exponent to the positive, to the bottom to make it positive. Now when I find the second derivative, I believe I'm going to use the quotient rule, which is the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. Oh goodness, okay, so the bottom is is 2, 2 plus x squared squared. So that derivative, subtract 1 from the exponent, and then the derivative of the inside part is 2x. So let's see, what have I got? I've got 4x all divided by the bottom squared. So since it's already squared and I square it again, that would be to the fourth power. That's pretty scary. I have to find out where that would be undefined or zero. And this is where your algebra skills have got to come in handy. Right, so I'm going to look at the top, and I want you to notice that they each have a 2 plus x squared, and they each have a negative 2. So I'm going to take out a negative 2 and a 2 plus x squared to the first power. So let's see, I took out that. That's going to leave me 1 2 plus x squared minus I took off the negative 2, so that leaves me the 4x squared. And then I took this out, so that's gone. And on the bottom I have 2 plus x squared to the fourth power. Not done yet. Let's reduce, because I have one of these divided by four of those. I can reduce and change that to a 3 is 2 minus x squared minus 4x squared is that. So that was much more algebra intensive. We still haven't found the concavity. right? So we have to know when this equals to 0 and when that's undefined. right? If I set this equal to 0 and cross multiply, I'm going to get the numerator equal to 0. And that's always true. The fraction can only be 0 if the numerator is 0. So let's do some algebra. I'm going to divide by negative 3. And now I'm going to take the square root, and don't forget my plus or minus. Okay, so that's where it's equal to 0. Now, is it undefined? So that's going to come from the denominator. So I'm asking, is 2 plus x squared ever equal to 0? Well, I don't think so. 
because if I took the square root of that, that would give me an imaginary number. If you think about it, what number could you possibly choose for x square it and add 2 and get 0? There's just not one. So it's, uh, it's defined everywhere, but these would be our points that we need to check on our number line. All right, so I'm going to pick something out here so you could punch in what is the square root of 2 thirds. It's about 0.8. I'm going to come over here and choose negative 1 and then 0 and positive 1. And again, I'm evaluating the second derivative. So I need the second derivative evaluated at those points is negative 2 times 2 minus 3 times x squared. Now the denominator, I could also put that in there, but I want you to look. This is always positive, cubed is always positive, so this is going to be over something positive. Remember, we don't care what it equals to, we're just seeing is it positive or negative. So I have negative 2, 2 minus 3 over something positive. Negative times negative, that's positive over positive, which is positive. So that means it's going to go up. Then I'm going to take the second derivative and evaluate it at 0. So we're going to have 2 minus 0, that's, two times, that's a negative 4 over something positive. That's going to be negative, so that's going to be concave downward. And then I'm going to evaluate the second derivative at positive 1, and I'm going to get positive over positive, which is also positive, which means it's concaved upward. So my concavity would be up, and it would be downward. So the hard part about that is the algebra. So we now have a quotient, so I'm going to have to use the quotient rule for my first derivative. And I'm going to go ahead and distribute and make it as pretty as possible. And even though I can factor the top part, I don't think that's going to help me, so I'm not going to use that. I'm going to come back to here. So that's my first derivative. Now I've got to take the second derivative, again, using the quotient rule. Okay, so my bottom, if you notice this, this is x minus 1 squared. So that derivative, subtract 1, but the derivative of the inside part is just 1. So let's see, the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all divided by the bottom squared, but since it was already squared, now it's raised to the fourth power. All right, let's see if I can uh, take out a GCF, do some factoring. Let's see what happens. Let's see, this is x minus 1 squared. I can take out a 2. Um, this already has a 2, but let's see, I can... I don't know if that's going to help me at all. Uh, I'm going to leave that as is. Okay, so now notice I have how many of those? I have 3. That's to the first power. So I can factor out, let's see, they've got an x minus 1 in common, and they also have a 2 in common. So I'm going to take that 2 and an x minus 1 to the first power. That's going to leave me an x minus 1 squared left here. And that's going to go, that's going to go, and I have that left. Now I can reduce, because I have 1 here and 4 here, so that's going to leave me 3 on the bottom. And just like last time, I'm going to uh, see what I can do with that numerator. So I think I'm going to go ahead and FOIL this part out, and then distribute that negative. And some nice things start happening. Let's see, those add to 0, those add to 0. So believe it or not, all I've got is 2 on top of x minus 1 cubed. That's my second derivative. So when is that second derivative equal to 0? Never. It's a fraction, and the numerator is just a 2, so it cannot equal to 0. But where is it going to be undefined? Where could x minus 1 equal to 0? Well, when x is 1, that is undefined. So again, I'm going to put that on my number line, and I'm going to evaluate my derivative on either side of 1. So I'm going to have 2 over negative 1, which is negative. So that's down. So this is negative, so that's concave down. 
here I'm going to have 2. Negative 2 cubed is negative. That's also negative, so it's concave downward. And so we would say it's concave downward from negative infinity to 1, and then 1 to infinity. We do not include that 1 because the second derivative was undefined there. So some interesting algebra, but don't give up.